Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering Splunk.conf19. Brought to you by Splunk. Okay, welcome back everyone. It's theCUBE's live coverage here in Las Vegas for Splunk.conf. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. It's the 10th anniversary of Splunk's.conf user conference. Our seventh year covering it. It's been quite a ride, what a wave. Splunk keeps getting stronger and better, adding more features, and it's really become a powerhouse as a, from a third party security standpoint. We got a, a CISO in the Cube on theCUBE today, Chief Information Security, John Frushauer, Deputy Chief Information Security Officer, New York Presbyterian, the award winner from the Data to Everywhere award winner. Welcome on theCUBE. Thank you, thank so you. So first of all, what's the award that you won? I missed the keynote, so I was working on a story this morning. Sure, what's sure. What's the award? Yeah, the Data to Everything award is really celebrating using Splunk um, kind of outside its traditional use case. You know, I'm a security professional. We use Splunk, we're a Splunk enterprise security customer. That's, that's kind of our daily duty, that's that's uh, that's our primary use case for Splunk, but you know, um, New York Presbyterian developed this system to track narcotic diversion, we call it our, our medication analytics platform, and we're using Splunk to track opioid diversion slash narcotic diversion, same term, um, across our enterprise. So, you know, looking for uh, um, improper uh, prescription usage, uh, over prescription, under prescription, prescribing for deceased patients, prescribing for patients that you you've never seen before. Um, uh, su Superman problems, like taking one pill out of the drawer every time for the last 30 times to build up a stash. You know, not resupplying a cabinet when you should have 30 pills and you only see 15. What happened there? Um, everything's data. Uh, it's, it's data to everything. And so we use this data to uh, to try to solve this problem. So this is a bit, so obviously drug, that's a great use if people will find the drugs, they're going to work hard for it. But that's just theft, that's just an insider threat kind of concept. Um, Absolutely. Well, as a CISO, you know, security obviously paramount. What's changed the most? Because look at, I mean, just looking at Splunk over the past seven years, log files, now you got cloud native tracing on the KPIs. Sure. You now have massive volumes of data coming in. You got core business operations with IOT, sure. things all instrumental. Sure, sure. As a security <laughs> officer, that's just a pretty big surface area. Yeah. How do you look at that? What's your, what's your philosophy on that? Um, you know, a lot of what we do, uh, and, and, and my boss, uh, the, the CISO Jennings Oski, a lot of what we look at uh, is endpoint protection and, and really driving down to that, that smaller element of what we can police and control. I mean, 10, 15 years ago, Information security was all about perimeter control. So you, you've got firewalls, defense and depth models. I have a firewall, I have a proxy, I have an endpoint solution, I have an AV, I have some type of you know, a, a data redaction capability, data masking, data labeling capability. Um, and I think we've seen, I don't think security has changed. I hear a lot of people say like, oh, well information security is so much different nowadays. No, I, you know, I'm a military guy. I, 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 I don't think anything's changed. I think the target changed. Uh, and I think the target moved from the perimeter to the endpoint. And so we're very focused on um, user behavior. We're very focused on um, endpoint agents and uh, and what people are doing on their individual machines that could cause the risk. We're in, we're entitling and, 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 and providing privilege to end users today yeah. that 20 years ago we would have never granted. You know, it was a few people with the keys to the kingdom and inside the castle keep. Nowadays, everybody's got an admin account yeah. and everybody's got some level of privilege. And it's the endpoint, it's the individual that that we're most focused on, making sure that they're safe and they can operate effectively in the hospitals. What are some of the tactical things that have changed? Obviously the endpoint obviously shifted, sure. so some tactics have to change. Probably, again, operationally you still get to solve the same problem. Attacks, insider threats, et cetera. Yeah. What are the tactics, what new tactics have emerged that are critical to you guys? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question. I mean, has really anything changed? Is the game really the game? Is the con really the same con? I mean, you look at look at you know uh, titans of security and and think about guys like Kevin Mitnick that that pioneered you know social engineering and and um, this sort of stuff and and really it's really just convincing a human to do something that they shouldn't do, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you can read all these books about uh, phone freaking and, and going in and convincing the administrative assistant to, that you're just late for the meeting and you need to get in through that special door to get into that special room and bingo, then you're in the telco closet and, and you know, you've got access. Nowadays, um, you don't have to walk in to that same administrative assistant's desk and convince them that you're just late for the meeting. You can send a phishing email. Uh, so the tactics 
tactics, I think, have changed to be more personal mm -hmm. and more direct. Uh, the phishing emails, the spear phishing emails, I mean, we're a large healthcare institution. We get hit with those types of, of targeted attacks every day. Uh, they come via mobile device. Uh, they come via the phishing emails. Look at the, uh, the, the um, Google Play Store. Just, yeah. I think, in the last month has had two apps that have had some type of backdoor or malicious content in them that got through the app store and got onto people's phones. We had to pull that off people's phones, which wasn't pretty. Yeah. But I think it's the same game. It's the same kind to convince humans to, to, to do stuff that they're not supposed to do, but the delivery mechanism, the tactical delivery has changed. How has Splunk get involved? Because you know, I've, I've always been a big fan of Splunk. People know me, know that. But pretty much been a fanboy. The way they handle large amounts of data, log files, they, they crush that use case. Sure. And then expand it out into other areas. People love to use Splunk to bring in their data and to, and to get, bring it into, I hate to use the word data lake, but I mean, just getting yeah. you know, control of the data. How is data um, uh, used now in your world? Because you've got a lot of things going on. You got, you got uh, healthcare, sure. IOT, people. Sure. sure. I mean, sure. lives are in, on the line. Lives are on the line, uh, yeah. And, and there's things, things you got to be aware of, and data's key. What is your, your well, approach? Well, first, I'm going I'm to shamelessly plug uh, uh, a quote I heard from Haiyan Song uh, this week, who leads the security practice. And she said the data uh, is the oxygen of AI. And I just, I love that quote. I think that's just a fantastic line. Data is the oxygen of AI. I wish I'd come up with myself, but now I owe a royalty fee. I think you could probably extend that and say, you know, d data is the lifeline of Splunk. So if you think about a use case like our medication analytics platform, um, we're bringing in data sources from uh, our, our time clock system, our multi-factor authentication system, our remote access desktop system, um, logs from our electronic medical record system, logs from the cabinets that hold the narcotics that every time you open the door, you know, a log event is created. So we're bringing in kind of everything that you would need to see, aside from doing something with actual yeah. video cameras and tracking people in some augmented reality matrix whatever it is, yeah, yeah. Um, we've got all the data sources to really pin down, all the data that we need to pin down, okay, uh, Nurse Sally, you know, you opened that cabinet on that day on your shift after you authenticated and pulled out this much oxy and distributed it to this patient. I mean, we have a full picture. So a full supply trail. chain of everything. We can see, you know, everything that happens. And with every new data source that's out there, the beauty of Splunk is you just add it to Splunk. I mean, the Splunk handles structured and unstructured data. Splunk handles, you know, syslog feeds and JSON feeds. And there's a, I mean, there's just, it doesn't matter. You can just add that stream to Splunk enrich those events that we're recording today. We have another solution uh, which we call the privacy platform, really ba built for um, our risk, or excuse me, our privacy team. And in that scenario, kind of the same data sets. We're looking at um, uh, time cards, we're looking at authentication, we're looking at access, and you visited this website uh, via this proxy on this day. Uh, but the information from the EMR is very critical because we're watching for people that open patient records mm -hmm. um, when they're not supposed to. We're the number five hospital in the country. We're the number one hospital in the state of New York. We have a large cavalcade of very important people that are our patients, um, and people want to see those records. Uh, and so the privacy platform is designed to get audit trails for looking at all that stuff and say, hey, Nurse Sally, we just saw that you looked at patient Billy's record. That's not good. Um, let's investigate. We have about 30 use cases for privacy. So it's not in context of what she's doing. That's where the data comes in? or That's where the data comes in. I mean, it's an event. You know, Nurse Sally opens up the EMR and looks at patient Billy's record. Maybe patient Billy wasn't on the chart, or patient Billy is a VIP, or patient Billy is, for whatever reason, not supposed to be, you know, on yeah. that. Um, on that docket for that nurse, on that, that schedule for that nurse, we're going to get an alarm. Yeah. The privacy team's going to, oh, well, uh, uh, are, are they supposed to look at that record? Yeah. I'm just giving you kind of like two or three use cases, but there's about 30. Yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, celebrities, whether it's Donald Trump, who probably went there at some point, everyone wants to get his <clears throat> taxes and records to just general patient care. Just general I mean, patient care. Yeah, exactly. And our privacy of our, of our patients is paramount. I mean, especially in this yeah. digital age where, like we talked about earlier, everyone's going after yeah. making 
a human do something silly, right? We want to ensure that our humans, our nurses, yeah. our best in class patient care professionals are not doing something with your record they're not supposed to do. Well, John, I want to get your thoughts on a story I did uh, a couple weeks ago called the Industrial IoT Apocalypse Now or Later. <laughs> and this, yeah. this, the, 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 the provocative story was simply trying to raise awareness that malware and spider phishing, this is tactics for that endpoint is critical, obviously. Sure. Uh, you pointed that out, everyone sure. kind of knows that. But until someone dies, until there's actually a catastrophe where you can take over physical equipment, whether it's a self-driving bus or yeah. go into a hospital and not just do Absolutely. ransomware, Absolutely. actually use the industrial equipment to kill people, um, sure. to cause a lot of harm. Right. Uh, this, this is an industrial kind of the hacking kind of mindset. Yeah. There's a lot of conversations going on. Not enough mainstream conversations, but some of the top people are talking about. This is kind of a concern. What's your view on this? Is it something that needs to be talked about more of? Is it uh, uh, just BS? Is, should it be? <laughs> what, what, is, it, is there any signal there that's worth talking about uh, around protecting of physical things? that are attached to the network. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is a huge, huge area of interest for us. Biomedical device security at, at New York Presbyterian. We have anywhere from about 80 to 90,000 endpoints across the enterprise. Every ICU room um, in our organization has about seven to 10 connected devices in the ICU room, from infusion pumps to, to intubation machines to uh, heart rate monitors and, and uh, diox, SpO2 monitors, all this stuff. Um, all IP and connected. All connected, right? Via via and and the 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 topology or the medium in which they're connected changes. Some are Zigbee and Bluetooth and Hardline and Wi-Fi, and we've got all these different protocols that they use to connect. Um, we buy biomedical devices at, at volume, right? And uh, biomedical devices have a long path towards FDA certification. So a lot of times they're designed years before they're fielded, and when they're fielded, they come out and the device manufacturer says, all right. We've got this new widget. It's going to, you know, save lives. So it's a great widget. It uses this yeah. protocol called TLS 1.0. Yeah. And as a security professional, I'm sitting there going, "Really? Like, I'm not buying that." But that's kind of the only game. That's the only widget yeah. that I can buy because that's the only widget that does that particular function. And even, you know, it was yeah. made. So, so this this is a huge problem for us. Is, is endpoint device security, ensuring there's no vulnerabilities, ensuring we're not increasing our risk profile by adding yeah. these devices to our network and endangering our patients, so it's a huge and area. And also compatible to what you guys are thinking. Like I can imagine, like, why would you want a multi-threaded uh, processor on a light bulb? I mean, scope yeah. it down, turn it on, turn it, it off. Scope it down for its intended purpose, yeah. I mean, FDA certification is all about, you know, the device performs its intended function. Um, but, so we've, we've, you know, we've really leaned forward, our CISO has really leaned forward with initiatives like the S-Bomb. Uh, he's working closely with, with uh, the FDA to develop kind of a set of baseline standards, yeah. ports and protocols, software and services. The, it uses these libraries, it talks to these servers in this country, and then we have this portfolio that a security professional can say, okay, I accept yeah. that risk, that's that's okay, I'll put that on my network, you know, moving on. But this is absolutely a huge area of, yeah. of, of concern for us. Uh, and as we get more connected, we are very, very leaning forward on telehealth and delivering a great patient experience from a mobile device, a phone, a tablet. That type of delivery mechanism spawns all yeah. kinds of privacy concerns yeah. and interoperability concerns with protocols, what's protected. Exactly. That's good, I'd love to follow up with you on that. Something we can drill double double down on, but while we're here at Splunk, I want to get back to sure. you know, data. Um, thank you, by the way, for sharing that insight. It's something I think is really important, uh, industrial IoT uh, protection. Sure. Um, diverse data is really feeds a lot of great machine learning. You're only as good as your next blind spot, right? And sure. when you're doing pattern recognition. Yeah. <laughs> when you're using data. Absolutely. So data is, Data, right? Data can, you know, telegraph to other data. You mixing data is actually could be a good thing. Um, most sure, professionals sure. would agree to that. Um, what, how do you look at diverse data? Because um, in healthcare, there's two schools of thought. There's the old HIPAA. We don't share anything. We got client privacy. Right, you mentioned right. that to full sharing right. to get the maximum out of the AI or machine learning. Sure. How are you guys looking at the data, diverse data, the sharing? Because in security, sharing's good too, right? Sure, sure, What's sure. What's your thoughts on sharing data? I mean, sharing data uh, 
across our institutions, which we have great relationships with uh, in New York, uh, is very fluid at, at New York Presbyterian. I mean, we're, we're a large healthcare conglomerate with a lot of disparate hospitals uh, that you know, came as a result of partnership and acquisition. They don't all use the same electronic health record system. I mm -hmm. think right now we have seven in play and we're converging down to one, yeah. but that's a, that's a lot of data sharing that, that we have to focus on between seven different EHRs. A patient can move from one institution to the next for a specialty procedure yeah. and you got to make sure that their data goes with them. So, yeah. you know, I, I think we're pretty, we're pretty decent yeah. at, at sharing the data when it needs to be shared. As, as the other part of your question about artificial intelligence, really I go back to like medication analytics. You know, a large part of the medication analytics platform yeah. that we designed does a lot of anomaly detection, stochastic anomaly detection on diversion. So if we see that, let's say you're, you know, a physician and you do knee surgery, so I'm just yeah. making this up. Yeah. I am not a clinician, so we're going to hear a lot of yeah. stupidity here, but yeah. bear with me. So you, you, you do knee surgeries, and you do knee surgeries once a day, every day, Monday through Friday, right? And after that knee surgery, which you do every day in cyclical form, you prescribe 2,000 milligrams of Vicodin. That's your standard. And you're, and doctors, you know, they're humans. Yeah. Humans are built on patterns. That's your pattern, 2,000 yeah. milligrams. That's work for you. That's what you prescribe. But all of a sudden on Saturday, a day that you've never done a knee surgery in your life for the last 20 years, you all of a sudden perform a very invasive knee surgery procedure that apparently had a lot of complications because the duration of the procedure was way outside the bounds of all the other procedures. And if you're kind of a, a, a math geek right now, you're probably thinking, I see where he's going yeah. with this because you just become an anomaly. Yeah. And then maybe you prescribe 10,000 milligrams of Vicodin on that day. A procedure outside of your schedule yeah. with a prescription history that we've never seen before. Event. That's the beauty of funneling this data into Splunk's ML Toolkit and then visualizing that. I love the 3D visualization, right? Because yeah. anybody can see like, okay, all this stuff, the school of fish here is yeah. safe, but these I've got to focus on, yeah. right? And so we put that into the ML Toolkit and then we can see, okay, Dr. X, we have 10,000, a little over 10,000 physicians across yeah. New York Presbyterian. Dr. X right over here, um, that does not look like a normal prescriptive scenario as the rest of their baseline. And we can tweak this, and we yeah. can change precision, we can change accuracy, we can move all this stuff around and say, well, let's just look on yeah. uh, medical record number. Let's just focus on procedure type. Let's focus on campus location. What if they prescribe from a different campus? That's anomalous. Yeah, yeah. And so that is huge for us, using the ML Toolkit to look at those anomalies and then drive uh, the, the privacy team, the risk teams, the pharmacy analytics yeah. teams to say, oh, I need to investigate So that. that's a lot of heavy lifting for you. Let you guys be a look at data that you need to look at. Absolutely. Gives you a, a dashboard. Final question, Splunk in general, are you happy with these guys? Obviously, they do a big part of mm. your data. Um, what should people know about Splunk 2019 this year, and uh, are you happy with them? Oh, I mean, Splunk has been a great partner to, to New York Presbyterian. Um, we've done so much uh, incredible development work with them, and, and really, um, what I, I, I like to, to talk about it is, as Splunk for healthcare, um, you know, we've created, we've solved some really important problems in our space, in this, in this vertical, uh, but we're looking, we're leaning really far forward into things um, like uh, risk-based analysis, peri-op services. Uh, we've got an antimicrobial stewardship program that we're looking at, at developing into Splunk, so we can watch that. That's a huge, uh, not, I wouldn't say as big of a crisis as the opioid epidemic, but, but an equal important crisis to medical professionals across this country. And these are all solvable problems. This is just data, right? Yeah. These are just events that happen in different systems. If we can get that into Splunk, we can yeah. cease the archaic practice of looking at spreadsheets and lookup tables and people spending days yeah. to find one thing to investigate. Well, Splunk's been a great partner to us. Um, you know, the tool has been fantastic in helping us in our journey uh, to, to provide best in class patient care. Well, congratulations. John Freshour, Deputy Chief Information Security Officer in New York, Presbyterian. Thanks for that insight. Great uh, insight welcome. into the healthcare and your challenge and your opportunity. Congratulations. Yep. We're the award winner, Data to Everything Award winner. I got to get that slogan, get used to that. It's to everything. Thank you. Getting Thank things you. done. <laughs> He's a doer. I'm John Furrier here on theCUBE doing the CUBE action all day for three days. We're on day two. We'll be back with more coverage after this short break.